Thank you. Good morning. How are you? Good. Coffee is good? That is nice. I love conferences where I got like barista. It's just the best. Thanks for having this. Uh, I love it. So my name is Fred, uh, Frederick Harper. Uh, just call me Fred. I guess it's easier in English to say Fred. I'm from Montreal, not too far away from here. But this is my first time in Vermont. And this is how you welcome me with that weather. Like, thank you. Uh, I know that, that most of my, uh, my folks in Montreal, they come here at least once a year to do apple picking, which I did not do. So one day I will do it. But uh, again, thanks for having me. Uh, quite a lot of pressure, like first track on the developer side. Uh, I'm not a UX expert. Uh, I'm, I'm a developer advocate. So I used to be a developer for many years, uh, creating software full time. Now I'm talking about software. I'm talking to developers. And Nowhere is not a company that I'm working for. It's just that I don't have a job right now. Uh, I got a small issue with my last job. Lost my job a month and a half ago. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> now I'm in discussion for the next job. We'll probably learn something. Uh, Maybe today or, or next week, I'm in discussion with a great company, but still love to talk about my passion of technology. So if you want to tweet during the presentation, at FRPR is my Twitter. Uh, my blog is fred.dev. I'm going to put the slides there. I usually record my talks, but uh, the nice folks behind the room are doing it for me. That's going to be even more professional and more beautiful. So today, I'm here to talk to you about building web apps that don't suck. How many people in the room are developers? Amazing. The other people, you're like UX designer, UX expert, UI, whatever. Like, what are you doing? I do a lot of UX. Do you, okay. So you may be bored a little bit by that talk <laughs> because it's really developer centric, but we'll see. Uh, so since there's a lot of developer in the room, I, I heard a couple of things like people who cannot code, like people who are not coding, they're like, coding is fucking hard. People who don't try at all, people who never try to code or just don't want to try, they're like, coding is fucking hard. <laughs> Teachers, people that are teaching coding, like education, uh, people in those like two weeks crash course of like software development, what do they say? Coding is fucking hard. Novice developers, so people like right, junior that are starting to code, coding is fucking hard. But I'm not done there, because there's no better thing than swearing more than four times in the talk. Uh, so pro developers, how many of you consider yourself pro developers? Like, like a couple, I don't know, four or five years maybe of experience will say, yeah, so coding is hard. Do you agree? If you say no, you're lying to yourself. Like I'm doing this for like more than 16 years. I know I'm whole, but like coding is fucking hard. Like famous developer, like people like the rock star, and I hate that word, and I know it's on the title of my book. I didn't choose it first, but famous developers, coding is fucking hard. And business people, <laughs> coding is easy. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And, and like, Three years ago, I went back as a freelancer. I was doing Project Rescue. And my customers were like, oh, I just need you to have those two features. That should take like two days. I'm like, no, actually two weeks. They're like, no, it's just two pages, like two features. Like, yeah, but you know, like there's the database I need to talk about. There's the API. And I need to do the front end. And I need to do some testing. And I need to be sure that everything's going to work. And you know, it's a complicated feature. I'm like, yeah, but it's just about showing a couple of boxes on the screen. I'm like, yeah, seriously, like coding is super easy. That's blowing my mind. And the thing is that it was not just about me wanting to swear in a talk. It was more about making a point. Being a software developer is not easy. It's amazing. It's a great job. I love it and I hate it, but most of the time I love it. Playing with technology is nice. I remember, I'm going to say this, I'm going to have goosebumps. I remember the first time I print a Hello World 16 years ago on the blue screen. It was Turbo, Turbo C++, something like this. Hello World. And I was like, oh, shit, I did that. I print that. So this is amazing. And one of the things, by doing all those conferences and all those talks, one of the things that I found is that when I started compared to today, it's a lot harder to be a developer. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to say that it was a lot easier also in the past. But we used to have less power, which means 
Yeah, maybe it was a little bit difficult because we have less power, but we were used to have computers that were not powerful, and all computers were not powerful. Actually, they were powerful for that time. But compared to today, now we're used to have all those devices. My phone is more powerful, more powerful. I don't know why I'm struggling with that word. More powerful than uh, my phone is more powerful than my computer was. My first computer was, and way more powerful. I will stop to say that word. <laughs> we used to have a limited amount of devices. Uh, smartphone was not even a thing. Uh, my first mobile application were BlackBerry application, yes. Uh, Windows Mobile, not Windows Phone. So I'm talking about a couple of years ago. But we have a limited number of computers to keep in mind. Uh, if we were doing some standalone web application, hey, resolution was 800 by 600. That was the only thing we had to care about. And the, uh, I don't remember his name, but the, uh, the keynote was talking about dial-up. I realize that right now when I'm showing that picture, there is probably half of the room was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> that thing is making annoying noise, but gave me the freedom to have 10 minutes to load one picture. That was amazing. So that was the internet before. The connection was slow. Now we're used to fast internet connection. But the thing is that we're used here in North America, in the States, in Canada, in some places in Europe. But last time I did a workshop, I was in India. And I was like, by the way, I think there was an issue with the Wi-Fi. I was at a conference, and the organizer came, and it was like super like, stressed about, like, oh, no, no, we really want, like, they're super welcoming, and they want everything to be perfect. And it was like, no, the internet is super fast. And I was like, oh, sorry. That was like slower than what I used to have when I don't get a great coverage on my phone, but I was fast for them. And we tend to forget that in different places, our customers don't have the same access as we have. But anyhow, everything to say that all those things together made our life easier as developer because we stopped to care about optimization. We stopped to care about the size of our data. We stopped to care about the performance of our application most of the time. Maybe not you. I did. Maybe nobody in the room, but I did. I stopped to care about those things. Uh, so today my talk is not about the new shiny thing. It's not about the new framework that will disappear in two weeks. It's not about the new library that won't be supported in one month. It's about using the actual skills you have right now and go back to basic. So some people will leave the room and say like, oh, Fred, you're a genius. Like, that was the stupidest talk I ever had, I haven't listened to, because you were telling me things that I already known. But be honest with yourself and ask yourself at the end of the talk, do I still do those things? Do I still care about those things? I'm going to talk about a lot of optimization, a lot of details around how we can create better application in a lazy way. I'm lazy. Don't know for you. I think most developers are. Uh, maybe it's not true, but I think it's quite true. I'm quite lazy. Uh, I want to, things to be easier, to be faster. Uh, so those tricks will be quick things that you can do right after the talk. That won't ask you too much. Uh, of a stretch to do those things. Mm. I just love cats, so that's why. Let me talk to you about UX and UI. I know they're not the same thing, but and I'm nowhere near an expert when it comes to UX. But I'm a firm believer that if you do a great UI for your users, that's going to give them a great experience. So that's going to help them to have a better experience. And some of us may, be, um, may, may have the advantage of working with designers, working with UX experts. But most of my life, when I was building software, I had no UX expert, expert in my team. Actually, when I started, the UX was not a thing, even if it was always like part of what we do. Like The user experience is always uh, something important, but that term was not coined. It was not like, oh, we need UX expert to understand how it's working. Actually, maybe big company had, but like we didn't have any. This is a whole book. Sorry, Josh. It's been a couple of years. Uh, Tapworthy, uh, really a couple of years. Uh, you can even see like the design from like iPhone, uh, really, really old icon. And uh, Josh, that book is really nice because it was for development for iPhone. But one of the things that stick with me for all those years is that when I built a software, 
I need to think about the motivation of my users. Why are they using my software? Why are they going on my website? And there is three things. Coming from the book, it was about I micro-tasking. And I put micro inside of bracket because I'm tasking, I'm doing stuff, I'm, I'm, I need to achieve something. That can be applied outside of a mobile application. I'm local, which is probably mostly on the mobile phone. So on my, on my smartphone, I'm local. I need to do something local, a check-in. I need to find a place to taste craft beer because I love it. And I can, you can see that I love craft beer. Third one, I'm bored. Right now, people playing with their phones. It's because you're bored. You're like, oh no, Fred is not interesting, so I'm gonna play with my phone and try to install Flappy Bird. It's not there anymore, he told us this morning. Uh, so if you're bored. So when I build an experience for users, it seems like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But keep those things in mind when you're building the UI. Because most of the time, there is a big difference between what the expectation of the users and what we're giving to the users. And I don't know if you know XKCD. Uh, I love those comics. And maybe, don't know if you can read on the back, but basically there is two diagrams. And the first one is like, what do people are expecting when they go on a, on a university website? And what the university website thinks that a user wants? And the only thing that is common is like the full name of the school. Like, I don't know for you, when you go, actually, it, it is pretty funny because it's true. When you go on a university website, I want to see courses, I want to see, like, uh, the schedule, and, like, I have all those, like, oh, there is a club, like, tennis club, and, oh, we win that prize with the full, full, football team, and, you know, like, all those things that, personally, I don't care. This is not what I'm looking for. And too often, that happened. So I would say my first trick, which is not totally developer-centric, but we need to think about this, is think about the content. And there is something called mobile first, content first. We have been talking this for years, but we still don't do it properly. We still don't do it. Yes, now we're doing responsive website. Amazing. Now my content adapt to different viewport, adapt to different screen size. But what about my content? Most of the time we go that way. We create for the big screen. And we change our CSS and we adapt for smaller screen, which is nice for most of the cases. Think about a university website where there is like a ton of information. We should probably do the other way around. And this is super hard, complicated, annoying. You're going to be pissed off. You're going to be frustrated if you don't have anyone uh, managing the content for you, the design for you, because this is super difficult. You need to make decisions about what's the most important content. And for me, that was a game changer because my project were taking a little bit longer to start, but I was always more successful because I was doing the hard job there. And it's a lot easier to have stuff, to have extra, to have bonuses to my UI, my interface, when I have already had the important stuff there. So think about that. It's a whole thing. We talk about this since forever. We don't do it. And quite often what happened, is that, yeah, I want to do a airplane simulator. This is what I have. This is amazing. I have all the option. I'm like, I don't know how that works. That is too complicated for me. And I'm flying a lot. I'm not a pilot. I have no idea. And you know what? What most users want out of this? They want this. And we're giving them this. But they want this. So think about the content. I will say, as a developer, if you have if you're in a team where you need to think about the content, think about the content. Even on, on smaller devices, IoT, maybe they just want this. And yeah, I used to work at Fitbit, so I used the Fitbit simulator. They have smartwatches, great smartwatches, by the way. I don't get a quote. A quote. It's just great stuff. So yeah, think about that. We're giving them those experiences. They probably want this. Same things when you're thinking about the space, the design. And you may not do design, but you're part of a team who may design. You work with designer, and they should, do, they should know their job. But you know what? When we're implementing design, sometimes it's not the, quite of the same result. Sometimes we've got an argument with designers, with UX expert. Never happened to me before. Uh, so think about where it's comfortable for you to access the device. There's more. There's nothing more annoying to me than like I'm on my one end and I want to reach 
like an option on my screen. And yes, Apple did that, like you need to flip twice down and the screen will lower and like that shit. That's not working well. So think about those things. Think about the Fitz law. And we're going to take the next 30 minutes to learn this. No. Wow. My jokes are so boring. That was a joke. <laughs> you need to laugh. You know, when people say joke, you laugh. So we're going to spend the next 30 minutes learn about the Fitz law. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I like you. Just you. The other people, not that much. So uh, the translation about the Fitz law is basically the bigger and closer target is, the easier it is to hit. This is a ha-ha moment. And the thing is that I have, I'm impressed because we are still not doing those kind of things. So that was all my knowledge about UX and UI, which I stole in many like articles and blog posts and from other speakers. But still, <laughs> all those years about doing software development, those are the things that I kept in mind. The second thing that is like more developer-centric is that we need to optimize our code and I'm not talking about going crazy and put like regular expression everywhere. I used to do Perl. I don't know if you even know what it is. Uh, it, like, if worse than that, it was embedded Perl. It was kind of like a weird PHP, like it was before PHP. It was like all regular expression. And the, the cool things at that time was to make the most out of one line of code, which was super nice at the moment, which two days after you were like, what the fuck I was trying to do? Like, I did not remember that. So the idea is not that. The idea is to, how many people are just like minimizing their code or shrinking their code? We don't do this anymore. Uh, you may use some HTTP eater that will do this for you, but as an example, if I go, or you download file that will do this for you. Uh, I use a tool called, actually, Let me just show you what I use. So I use two, three tools to do that. Uh, I use Altify.js, which is nice is that I'm a big fan of common line. And when we say common line is that I can integrate this in my uh, like deployment process. I can uh, put this in my CI tools that I'm using. I can integrate this everywhere. So I use Uglify.js, Uglify.js. Uh, there is a ton of minimizer, Uglifier, optimizer out there. I love this one. It's working well. Uh, actually, I always use also the Minify uh, from Babel. That is even better. Uh, is optimizing even better. Uh, there is also there is a ton of those like CSS Nano, uh, which is specific for CSS and all those tools. I love. I have a preference for everything that is open source because that gave me the opportunity to do PR if I need to add a feature or fix the bug myself, which most of the time I don't have to be because they're quite popular uh, too. If I check my code, can you see clearly in the back? Yeah. So if I check, obviously, everybody kind of like use jQuery or no, or if you don't use it, you know what it is. Most of the time, you're going to download the minimized version. It's already, it's already done for you. But I, download, I downloaded the full version, the jQuery. And as you can see, it's like three times the size. So what I can do, I can do, it's minify. And I can do it myself, just to show what that can be. So I don't know what the jQuery team is doing, but actually their minimize uh, technique is a little bit better than mine. But you're going to get the idea. They're, they're more expert than me. If I check now, my file is the min.js, it's 88k. It's quite a lot like, three times smaller. So jQuery was not a good example. I just needed a big JavaScript file to show you the example. But think about that. This is not that big. Like, we won't go crazy with that. But think about your website or web application where there is like hundreds of users, thousands of users, millions of users. And yes, there is caching. Yes, there is caching in the browser. Yes, you can have caching on your server side. But in the cloud era, in the serverless era, in whatever you want to call this era, uh, you pay for space, you pay for data, you pay for CPU, you pay for anything and everything. Most of the time, it's cheaper than paying a big package. But if you don't optimize those things, that's going to cost you money. If you don't optimize those things, that's going to slow down the process for the users. And I'm not an SEO expert, but you're also going to be penalized by Google and friends because the faster you are, the better, and there is tool for you to, uh, to check those things. So Babel minifying uh, is a great tool. 
that gave you the opportunity to give that, uh, to see that. And if you check, for those of you that never did that before, uh, so this is the full file, readable. You can have, like understand a little bit if you do JavaScript, even though there is complex thing there. If I check my file, nope. Yeah, actually, if I check my file, it's incomprehensible code. But what happened is that they changed the uh, function name to put smaller one, they removed the space. It's minifying, they call this minifying. Actually, it's also a good way to quote unquote protect your code. Uh, there is tool to unminify your code. There is tool that will probably help you to do that. But at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's more for me, it's more about the performance. There's some word that I'm struggling in English and perform, performance is one of them. So sorry my French. I can do the talk in French if you want, you prefer. <laughs> well, I can do that. Is it me or it's hot here? Okay, thank. I was like, I'm not sweating like this when I do a talk. Maybe I'm fatter than I thought. I need to do exercise. What's about that running thing that everybody does? Like, I try, but I roll, so it's like it's not working. One other thing you can do, and that is super important, and please don't check my, web, my website on this. I just moved to a new host. I didn't play with HD access yet. But one of the things, you need to minimize the number of HTTP requests, so try to minimize the redirection, try to minimize every 300, uh, try to minimize the number of files requests, so if you can put your CSS together, if you want, there is tools also that let you, when you minimize uh, for your code, you may have different CSS file or different JavaScript file, and you can minimize them inside one big file, so that will minimize the number of requests from HTTP, and this is good because you're gonna have the information display faster. Again, SEO, Google, uh, check the first time, uh, the time to first byte, so the respawn time between when you call your application or your server to the time that the customers, the client, the browser will receive it. And to help you achieve that, to be faster, you can do JZIP encoding. So think about the fact that you're gonna save some space in terms of like data transferred. It's just setting that you put in the HD access or the web config if you're using IIS. But you're gonna be quote unquote penalized on like that uh, code will need to be decode, will need to be unzip, on JZIP on the server side. But most of the time it doesn't matter that much. Use image sprite uh, when it makes sense. So basically it's bundling many image that are kind of like the same thing. I would say I use many icons on my site, uh, many social media icons. Instead of having an uh, 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 image file for LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, I will put them together. And with my CSS, I will just show a different viewport of my file. Uh, sometimes it makes sense, I usually hate to do that, but like when there's a lot of files that you can put together, do this, again, you're mini minimizing the number of HTTP requests. CDN, if you're on a cloud provider, most of them have CDN, there is also a company that are uh, just spe specializing in CDN, so basically it's having server that will have a copy of your content and distribute it from different places in the world, so that may make sense if you are, your company is here, but most of your users are in Asia. So maybe it's better to have your content in Asia, but you still have customer here, so you can use CDN to do that. HTTP cache headers. So the browsers by default will cache the content for the users, but on the server you can also cache some content, so you will save some uh, processing time, and you don't have to do a lot of things. It's usually just configuration for your web server. So usually Apache IIS has the same thing with uh, HTTP expired response header. Actually, I forget to tell you, but I will probably put the slide, I will, not probably, I will put the slide online, so if you want to take notes about the text there, uh, sorry about that, too late, but uh, like they will be online. Uh, cache the contents as much as possible. One of the two I really like, I used to, I used to use uh, Google Lightspeed, which was Google Speed and Site before, now they integrated in the browser, it's the audit, uh, when you go to the developer tool in the audit tab, uh, there's a way for you to kind of like audit the performance, uh, progressive web app, best practices and all those things. But recently, 
a friend of mine uh, told me about WebInt. And I really love it because this is the same kind of tool, but I have access to the common line, told you. I'm a common line person. And I install it. If I do int my website, you will cry seeing the report of my website right now. But what is great with that tool is that I will let a, uh, the tool generate the uh, report. But what is great with the tool is that you will see a report about my website. And again, this is free. Uh, this is part of the GS Foundation. They're working on it, so it's great code. It's open source. It's just, it's just nice. I can show you a report I generated before. There is 229 ints, and they're being polite. It's more like warning, error, things you should fix on your website. Told you, I just switched to a new team, switched to a new server. Uh, say what I say, not what I do. So uh, what is great is that it's not just about like improving, optimizing your website. It's about accessibility. It's about security. It's about compatibility, which is all the things that we care about but don't really do or don't really think or don't really have time to do. And what is even better is that if I'm looking at accessibility, which I'm not an expert, I'm like, oh, link must have discernible text. OK, I know that one. but. If I find one, OK, let's say that I don't know what it is. There is a help section about how I could fix. What does that mean? What I need to change on my code to make it happen? So this is the part that I love, because I get that great report. And on top of that, I got, <laughs> I got also into about how to fix things. And if I run this on the CLI, you probably see I got a, I got a, a oh my god, there is no default configuration. Uh, actually. I had no configuration, so it's taking the default configuration. But what I love is that you can configure everything and anything. If for you, and it shouldn't be, but it's an example, if for you, accessibility is not a priority, it's not something you want to do, you can say like, oh, don't give me int about accessibility, or like, oh, this one I know, but I cannot fix it because x, y, z. I don't want a warning anymore in my report. But please don't do that for accessibility. It's important. That is a great tool. I love it. I just love it. Images. How many people use images in their application? Thanks for raising your hand. Like the only people in the room, like, yeah, I'm the only one using images. Like, what are you doing? Just videos? You're from the Snapchat generation. Huh? I don't understand Snapchat. Uh, so use native image resolution as much as you can. Uh, this is nice to have the full resolution, but showing like 50% of it, I still don't load the full image. And this is the same thing when, we do, when you do responsive web design. There is a way for you to provide different pictures or different images depending on screen resolution, depending on different uh, parameter. Use the right image format. I did not know that thing until not too long ago. But for a picture, like a real picture, you better save the picture in JPEG. And take a picture you have in JPEG, save it in PNG. The size will go crazy for whatever reason. It's kind of like encoding stuff. Same thing for an image. So if I have an image, I take a screenshot of on my screen right now, and I save it in PNG, that's going to be the optimal format. If I save it in JPEG, that codec is not optimized for images. So save the right format and try it. You're going to be like, oh, I've, I don't know for me. I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I did this with a couple of images, and I probably lost 15 minutes of my life. But I was kind of like, oh my god, there's a difference between those things. And, and I did not know that, because I'm not a designer. For me, it was like, it's a different extension. Uh, so use the right extension. Use image preview for videos. Compress your images. Now, how many people does that? No, you're lying. Not half of the room. Nah, liars. Uh, actually, most people don't. Half of the room, I'm really impressed. So there's something with Vermont. Uh, or, or you're from Canada, maybe. Like the people <laughs> raise your hand, like good people, good developer. Yeah, OK. Uh, so <laughs> most people don't do this. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that when you're compressing images, uh, think about the fact that at some point that images need to be uncompressed. And when you have a limitation in memory, which is not the case most of the time. I'm, 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 it's mostly me from my time at Mozilla when my, my focus was Firefox OS, so really, really low-end devices. Uh, that was like 8 megabytes was taking a lot of space. but. There are so many ways to do that that you don't even have to care too much about this. Like on my blog, I'm using WordPress, and I'm using a services called Short Pixel. Uh, they have like 100 images per month free, uh, which I love. And it's, there's a plugin on my WordPress site, which I configure that every time I'm uploading a new image, 
do the optimization for me. It's, it's flawless, it's transparent, I love it. But hey, tell you, common line stuff, uh, if I go on my desktop and I check, I have a big image, because everybody named their big image, big image. Obviously, this is a cat, they're not mine. Like nobody's like, oh, oh my God, you're dog people, I guess. <laughs> Get out of that room. Uh, so big image, big image is like, is like somewhere, it's like six megabytes. I think it's worth it for a cap. But if there was a way for us to optimize this, so I never remember exactly what's the full code. Uh, so I'm using image min, image min. I have a strong accent today, I'm so tired. So image min, image min, image min, you know what I'm talking about. There's a CLI, and what is great is that you can install different optimizer, different plugin for different like PNG, for different type of compression. And now I'm using like the biggest one called, uh, not the biggest one, but the one that's gonna do uh, lossly compression. Uh, it's gonna do really good compression. You won't see the difference, but the size, you will see the difference in size. So if I run this, all the magic would happen in a second. I'm going to be in two, I'm going to be at three. And if I check right now, okay, my big image is like six megabyte. It's still really big, two megabytes, but I, it's like, it kind of like uh, tripled down the size, which was pretty good. And if I look there with my big and my small image of the cat, of course, it's not opening like I wanted. If I do that again. Okay, you don't want to, doesn't matter. If I switch, can you see the difference? Yeah, obviously the, the projector is not that good, so, but it's the same not that good. You agree? <laughs> can you see a difference? You know when, look, look I'm expecting an answer. Nope. Thank you! <laughs> I'm joking. You can say that. Is there any like uh, uh, speaker notes at the end? Like you can note the speaker and say they were good or bad or whatever. Oh shit. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah. So what's what's your Twitter handle? UX Burlington. Yeah. So my, my Twitter handle is UX Burlington as a speaker. So you can you can give notes to your UX Burlington. Uh, so the thing is that like most images and, and like now I save it's a big image. I save like four megabytes for my cat pictures. Uh, this is crazy, think about this again. Now I'm talking about small optimization and sometimes you're gonna save like 10 kilobytes. But like 10 kilobytes, multiply by 10, 100, 1000, it goes super, super fast. Do some testing. Now the time for you to lie again. Who's doing some tests? Liars. Uh, no, it's not true. Uh, yeah, but, but like we don't do tests. Like, like people were a little bit more shy, like, yeah. I kind of do tests, like, yeah, kind of. Uh, create unit testing, uh, create integration testing. Uh, test, like maybe do some, uh, what do you call this, like test first? Uh, test driven development? Start with test, uh, test it yourself. I remember the last time I was managing a team, which was a terrible experience of developer, and they were building stuff, and they were doing unit tests, integration tests, and they were good developer. And I was testing their stuff, and I was like, there is an issue there. And we're like, Fred, like users will never do that. And I'm like, that's right, this is exactly what's gonna happen. Because you say user will never do that, they will do it. So what I was doing, I was the dumbest, I think it was natural for me, but I was the dumbest user I was able to be. And they were pissed off because like, Fred, no, they won't click like 10 times on the button, like look at your user, they will do it. So you need to test your stuff and we don't do it because we're in a fast paced environment. Everything is goes fast, everything is quick. We, we need to deploy, we need to like launch the next version. We need to work on a new feature. So use test framework, that will make your life easier. If you do JavaScript node, uh, there is Mocha, that is probably one of the most popular Q unit uh, that is done by the people uh, doing jQuery. Test, test, and test. And test, test, and test. Like test, test, and test. Did I say it? Test. I use always strict mode when I do JavaScript. Uh, because JavaScript is so permissive, 
Like there's so many ways for you to do stuff. And when you use strict mode, that's going to prevent you to do stupid things. Uh, so it's just you put use strict uh, in your file in a specific scope, and uh, you're going to use what JavaScript called the strict mode. So I always use this. Makes my life a little bit harder at the beginning when I started to use it. Now it's kind of like part of like how I code when it comes to JavaScript. Avoid creating new objects when it's possible. Now I'm going to like the crazy little tips that won't save you a lot of things, except if you really have like a huge crazy application. This one, load JavaScript file at the end of the page. I think we were done with that one. I think we, we were like people understood that. No. And the reason is that most of the time you won't need JavaScript right at the beginning. And that will prevent the UI to be rendered. So put JavaScript at the end as much as you can. Put most of the file that you don't need to render your interface at the end of your website, at the end of your code, at, like just before the body. Uh, a sync. I want to see that word more often in the code. Like, do everything as sync as, as much as possible. Like, when you're loading data, don't freeze the UI because you're trying to fetch or update something. It should be kind of like an automatism. Like, you should do this all the time. That should be automatic. Maybe except C sharp people. Like, nobody uses XML anymore, but still. Like, JSON is so much faster, so much easier. Uh, mostly I'm talking JavaScript because this is most of what I'm doing. Like, if you use JSON to uh, store data, store information, it's just so much faster and also, I think, so much easier. And the two other things is like, if you're doing animation, uh, I don't do those things, but uh, don't scale image and draw image. Like, cache off screen on a canvas, uh, that's gonna make your life faster and easier. Uh, if you're doing some like do 2D, 3D, you're doing some animation, some games, uh, use WebGL instead of Context 2D. It's still a thing. That's going to use the GPU uh, when you can. So the graphic process unit instead of the CPU, uh, which is going to give you the opportunity to kind of like use both because design will use GPU and uh, other stuff will use the CPU. Do I need to explain that? So can someone tell me why Slack changed the logo? <laughs> it was not broken. OK, I get used to it. Like, it kind of like grown on me. But uh, at the beginning, I was like, I was part of the, like, the, the troll on the internet. I was like, oh my god, that is shit. Like, that is so good. I will never use Slack again. I'm like, yeah, I don't really have the choice. But like, human, like, we, are, we have an aversion to change. And the thing is that, for whatever reason, we think it's a good idea to redo all the design that our users are using for years, and that is great. And instead of just doing some like refreshing, we're doing everything all over again. We lost our customers because now they don't know where are the features. And, and sometimes it's like, yesterday I was, in, I, was in a, I was in a hotel in New York, and I was trying to take my shower. I was trying to take my shower. Uh, I was in the shower, and I was like, you know, those kind of like bath shower, and usually you have to like like pull a thing, and like now that like that's gonna shower. I I'm looking for letting the shower pour the water. I'm like, there's no thing to push, and look like there's no nothing, and I was like, I think I'm going crazy, and literally it took me between two to five minutes to find the way to take a shower and not a bath, and that was like they had like like under the how do you call this? Um, Say that again? Faucet. Say that like louder? Faucet. Yeah, thank you, faucet. Uh, that, that's that tickling things on the that I had to pull. But I was like, who the hell thought it was a good idea? <laughs> it's a perfect working design. And someone was like, let's change how we start the shower and those things. No, it, it took me two to five minutes. Taking a shower is quite natural. I, sh I should be able to do this, like start the shower and like I'm good to go. No. So someone decided to like, let's do something amazing. And I'm not even joking. It really took me between two to five minutes. Like the, the timing was perfect. I was like, that's why I'm going for an interview and I'm going to smell like shit. I'm like, no, I need to take my shower. Uh, you don't always need a framework or library. This is one of my pet peeves. You know? Document get element by ID works very well. You don't need jQuery to get an element from the DOM. Uh, there are some ways where it makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. And I think we forgot to code. Now I'm going to sound like, like the whole man yelling at the cloud. But I think f sometimes we forget about coding because we're so used to library. Put as much logic as, much logic as you can on the server side. Uh, that's going to be also kind of like product your IP-ish. 
thing accessibility and please again don't check my website for this I'm starting to just had like uh, alternate text to my images but I want it to be more accessible think about the people that like have vision problem or people that need to go to your website or application without a mouse like just try to go on your application that you're using day to day with a keyboard you will have fun because most of those applications are not accessible. And the good thing is that there is many tools out there that's gonna help you to check the information about accessibility and help you improve. WebIn was one of those tools that I was talking about. SSL, all the things. Like seriously, why? Like there is Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt right now, it's free. It takes literally three minutes to uh, like had SSL to your website or web application. And there are still people that are not uh, putting this. So think about security too. And again, don't fix it if it's not bro broken. Go the extra mile. It's not about optimizing, optimizing for speed, but it's about giving a good experience to your users. Think about security. And don't, you don't need to be an expert, but there's that organization called OWASP, which is the organization web accessibility security project, something like this. Uh, they're the expert when it comes to security. There's a lot of user groups everywhere in the world. They have a cheat sheet which lists 60 plus security issue that you can have in your application, what are those, uh, how you can fix this, how you can prevent this. So the idea is not to be an expert, the idea is to integrate this in your app development life cycle to understand that security is not an afterthought, it's important for your users. And once every three years I go read that cheat sheet just to remember like what are the things. There's also tools, and I'm slowly running out of time because I love to talk, as you can have seen. There's a tool called SNCC which I love. Uh, there's a lot of things free with SNICS, but it's working with different programming language. It's basically a tool that will help you to find uh, security vulnerabilities in your uh, programming language. So if I do a quick demo, and NPM has the same thing. So if you use, uh, if you do some node, you can do NPM audit. That's gonna give you a report. I can do SNCC monitor with SNCC. And the advantage of SNCC is that I think NPM audit is better for NPM, uh, for node. But uh, I think that uh, SNCC is better because also there is integration with many platforms. But that's gonna give me a report about like, hey, that library that I'm using in my software, I was testing on NPX, uh, which is a way to execute NPM package without installing them. Uh, I used to work at NPM like a month ago. <laughs> so uh, libNPM has security issues. I'm like, now I know I can update the package to the next version and be sure that I won't have vulnerabilities in my code. Those are tools, there's plenty of tools. So in the end, and I told you there was a quick like, like those are like the 10,000 quick tips that you can get out of that uh, presentation. But in the end, the philosophy behind my talk, because I'm, I'm a philosopher, sorry, I tapped the mic. Uh, don't make us think about the interface and now I'm putting myself in place of a customer. I don't want to think about the interface. I don't want to spend five minutes to find how to take my shower. It doesn't make sense. Or I love the web services where like, it's hidden under like five pages where you can delete your account. Like, okay, now you just want me to stay there. It's like, make things easier for me. Insulate us from the complexity. Keep things simple. Kiss, keep things simple. Make accomplishing your goal easier and faster. Again, same idea and optimize your stuff easier and faster. And this is the topic of the conference. It's like people, they want to think fast. And I remember when sometimes I'm looking for services, I'm like going to a website and everything is super slow. I'm like, oh no, I'm done. Looking for the next one. And you're gonna lose customer by doing that because I'm not the only one. I'm kind of like in between two, gener two generations. So I get the worst of the two generation, I guess. And one of the things is that I want instant gratification. I want to think fast. I'm used to fast stuff now. Help the user be awesome in the moment, because at the end of the day, it's about being amazing, it's about being awesome. So help the user being awesome. I will put the slides online. Uh, forget about the video that will be on UX Burlington side. But I have two minutes for a question. The keynote is not the only beautiful speaker today. I think I have a pretty face too. Uh, at least the face from there. Uh, my name is Fred. If you have any more questions after, so we have two minutes, but like if you don't have time to ask a question, I'm gonna be in the break. I'm gonna be there mostly all day. You can also send me an email, fred.dev, well, kind of a new website and then blog, blog for a long time, but uh, it's my goal to blog again. I'm gonna put the slide online. So, uh,